So many of you, of course, come here quite often uh, for the pre-performance talks, uh, but this is slightly different. If you like, this is a, a conference um, about the performing arts and education reform. Um, this month, both the new plans for the national curriculum and the cultural educational plan were published. And what we wanted to do today um, was to, should we say, separate fact from fiction, <laughs> um, have a conversation about actually what the changes are, what they will mean, what the recommendations are from people, and just actually start a debate here, finishing up with what it means locally and what the local plans are. Uh, my name is Kate Moss. I have no qualifications for chairing this at all, except for the fact that I chair all of these pre-performance events. Uh, but we have an expert panel, and I can see, looking round, I can see very many people Hello. who are obviously experts as well. We are simply going to ask, what are the educational reforms so far as the performing arts are concerned? And I have on the panel uh, three experts who are going to give a presentation for us to start uh, to have something to talk about. Um, on my right I have David Sword who is Head of Learning for West Sussex County Council. On my immediate left Lizzie Crump who co-runs the Cultural Learning Alliance and on my far left Jane Bryant Executive Director of Arts Work. Then we're going to uh, they're going to present factually, I believe, and then they're going to start to give their opinions about what the proposed changes actually mean. And I will open that up to the floor straight away so that anyone who would like to ask anything or make a contribution can do so. I'm going to hand over to David Sword, Head of Learning for West Essex County Council. David. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon to everybody. I'm just going to take you through some facts and figures about the, the national curriculum. Um, and if I'm, if I'm dwelling too long on stuff which is obvious to you, can you sort of signal that and I'll, I'll move on as quickly as I can. Um, so just a few basic facts. The national curriculum was first introduced uh, in 1988. Um, it's statutory for maintained schools, um, which means that it's not a statutory requirement for free schools and for academies. Uh, and that may be something that you may want to come back to at some point. And the national curriculum doesn't actually apply to the independent sector. At the outset, these were the, um, the, the if you like, the, the stated purposes of the national curriculum. It was to standardise the content um, taught across all state schools. I remember my children um, going to school, and at that point, you didn't really know what they were going to be taught, when, and, and what, what they were expected to achieve. It was a complete vacuum, really. Um, it was also about facilitating standardised assessment. Um, so that the system, if you like, could be measured as well as individual children. And it was very much geared towards um, beginning to support parental choice so that you could compare one school um, to another. A little chart there just showing you which subjects are in the national curriculum. Um, so th those really haven't changed since 1988, and there isn't actually a proposal to change those subjects fundamentally. Apart from IT is now going to be called computing, and we'll focus less on... Um, how you use, if you like, uh, the software and more on how actually you can control the computing yourself. Um, and I think that's probably been welcomed by quite a number of people. But you can see which subject applies to which of the key stages. Key stage one and two are in primary, key stage three and four are in secondary. Uh, and you'll see that some apply in some key stages and some apply in, in others. The three at the top are known as the core subjects of English, maths, and science, but I'm probably teaching, t telling you stuff you know already there. Uh, in key stage four, in other words, at the end of secondary, um, there are, in, in that stage, there are, uh, children make more choice about what they do within the national curriculum, and that will continue. So, um, and in terms of the arts, they can do art and design, music, dance, drama, or media arts. Um, and then there are those other subjects of design and technology, humanities, uh, and languages. Now, those, none of those subjects are, are compulsory, but a school has to offer them if a child wants to do them. And I'll leave you to sort out what that means in reality. So what is going to change? Um, first of all, as I say, those 12 subjects will still be included, and uh, RE is a statutory subject in its own right, was previous to the national curriculum. I can't go into all the details. Things are sort of changing very rapidly. In fact, uh, I went away on leave last week, and, uh, and the uh, Secretary of State came out with all his revisions, so my PowerPoint was rapidly rejigged this morning. So apologies if it's not entirely accurate. But um, I'd say English is characterized by a much stronger focus on the technical aspects of language, and perhaps less of a focus on cultural understanding. Um, less of an explicit focus on the drama curriculum, but it does include a drama curriculum. 
and, and initially, spoken language wasn't emphasized, but that has now been rectified in the, re in the revisions. And in PE, which is where the drama, where the dance curriculum is located, uh, the dance is still in there, but it's um, perhaps a little bit more loosely defined than it was before. Just to give you an idea of the sorts of things you'll see in the National Curriculum Guidance in Year 5 to 6 English, um, you'll see actually quite a, a, a lengthy statement there about drama um, and its, in, its place in the English curriculum. And at Key Stage 3 now, they have again revised that. There will be two Shakespeare plays to be studied at Key Stage 3. So those are the sorts of things you'll find in, in, in the documents. But uh, there's, there's a lot of detail. In fact, the English document now extends, I think, to 72 pages. This is a slimmed down curriculum. In art and design, again, these, are, these were the draft materials, but they haven't changed. You'll see those are the, the purposes, if you like, the aims to be achieved by the art and design curriculum. Music, again, familiar, I think, not a huge change from what we currently expect. Uh, so performance, learning to sing, musical notation, and so on and so forth. And then um, there's an area of the curriculum known as personal, social, health, and economic education. Uh, there, there, are, there aren't actual um, uh, programs of study for that, but the school has to make provision for it. Um, schools are also required to provide sex and relationship, educa sex and relationship education to pupils in, in secondary education. They're not required to in primary, but I think you'll find many primary schools will do that. Um, and there's, uh, there's also a clear statement about children who have special educational needs uh, and a clear emphasis on schools having to adapt the curriculum to meet their needs, and that may be, again, something you may want to come back to. I think probably one of the most radical things in the change is the removal of levels. At the, at the moment in the national curriculum, at every key stage, there's a number of levels which are defined as to what children need to achieve to gain those levels. Those levels have been removed, uh, and there's now just an end of key stage statements, so the children will be working all the way. So there'll be less prescribed assessment, and that will have some interesting implications, I think. Um, and the statutory assessment will only be at the end of the key stage. Um, you may have heard of the English baccalaureate. There have been a lot of discussion um, and various other things with similar names banded around. Um, I think it's important to understand the English baccalaureate applies to secondary schools, and it is actually not part of the curriculum as such. It's a way of measuring performance in secondary schools. And it's looking at a basket of subjects so it's the, the number of pupils or the percentage of pupils who achieve a C grade or above at GCSE in a basket of subjects including English, maths, and the sciences, history or geography, and a language. Now that's quite important because clearly if schools are going to be measured on those subjects, there's likely to be a considerable emphasis placed on those subjects. And the risk is, of course, it could be at the expense of some other subjects. So that is, if you like, a slightly whistle-stop tour through uh, what is actually a very complex area. But I think if I finish there and hand over to the other experts to fill in the more interesting bits. Lovely. David, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Lizzie. Just as David was saying, the EBAC is one of those things which is really driving the choices of children, young people and schools. It's a performance measure. So schools are judged on at secondary level those particular subjects that are enshrined within it. Really interestingly, another performance measure has just been introduced at A-level, which looks at exactly the same kinds of subjects. So it's sort of reinforcing that thing that's happening at GCSE, also at A-level, and it's called the Facilitating Subjects Performance Measure. It looks at exactly the same subjects, and the rationale behind that from government is that those are the subjects that they think young people need in order to progress to university. So, so they've put a real emphasis on those subjects. I think it's also worth noting another slightly subtle but really relevant thing that's happened at GCSE, which is that GCSEs are coded. They're given a, a very innocuous departmental code. Um, but a piece of legislation has just come in which states that subjects with the same code won't count separately towards those performance measures that we've just talked about. So dance and drama, for example, have just been given the same code. So if you're a young person, you may be given the opportunity to study those particular subjects, but as a school, only one of them can count towards your performance measures and, and your league tables. And, and that's a little change that is sort of subtle, but I think important to bear in mind. 
GCSEs themselves absolutely being reformed as we speak. And about three weeks ago, the Secretary of State um, put out a statement talking about the kinds of GCSEs he wants to see Ofqual, which is the body that, that does that reform, um, developing. Um, the headlines of what he wants those GCSEs to look like are, um, they've been in the press, I'm sure many of you have seen them, he wants them to be more linear, he wants them to be less modul modular, so that opportunity to do things in chunks and be assessed on them, he wants that, that to be eradicated as far as possible, and um, for young people to be assessed at the end of two years of study. Um, they want to make sure that there's more of an emphasis on knowledge testing in those GCSEs, so it's going to be more essay-based at, at the end of that work, where, where possible. Um, interestingly with GCSEs, the ones that have come out at the moment are the EBAC subjects, so those are the ones that they're going to reform first. Um, the arts subjects themselves, the Arts Council of England is doing some initial work looking to see if they can come up with some ideas about what good arts GCSEs might look like. What will happen after that is they will have to present their findings to Ofqual and to the Secretary of State and, and sort of say, this is what we think, will you take them on board for GCSEs? So it's going to be a really interesting picture over the next couple of years about whether we can find a GCSE model for the arts that fits with that more linear assessed model of GCSE that's been set out as the structure. Does that make sense? Is that something that we're looking at? I want to touch very briefly on the comprehensive spending review, which was um, the lovely statement from George Osborne a couple of weeks ago on the funding that will go through public funding and, and how it's going to be spent from 2015 onwards. It's really worth noting that the Arts Council itself will have been cut by almost a third over the last three years. Um, added to that, that national museums also will have been cut by all, almost a third, and that local authorities, crucially, will have been cut by 43%. Now, those three funders... Oh, also worth noting that the, the BFI got cut by a further 10% um, this month as well, so that's our, that's our national film sort of public funding sit, sitting in that. So the picture for many of the cultural organisations that work in partnerships with schools and with local authority and with central government to be delivering fantastic cultural learning for those children and young people is one of real straightened resource at the moment. People have been cutting and cutting and cutting and this latest round of cuts, even though it's only an extra 5%, only an extra 5%, it's 5% that adds up to you know, more than a third of overall funding. And whilst people have been very creative in finding ways to make those savings thus far, the sort of information we've been getting in the Cultural Learning Alliance is now's the time when some really difficult decisions are, are really going to have to be seen and people are going to start struggling. Just going to finish, because I'm sure I'm at my 10 minutes, <laughs> um, by just touching briefly on the National Plan for Cultural Education, which, as Kate said, was published um, a couple of weeks ago on a Friday. We've been waiting for the National Plan for Cultural Education for about 18 months now, um, and it followed on from a review that Darren Henley, who's the Managing Director of Classic FM, did of um, cultural education in England, which is a document that, if you haven't looked at, is really worth a read. Um, he sort of did a review... Um, again, on the back of the fact that he'd been asked to do one for music education. Um, interesting things to note are the music education review had 171 million over three years attached to it. It was historic local authority funding. It was ring-fenced. And Darren's review of music was there to see how that money could be better spent. Um, the kind of models he came up with and, and are now in, in operation are around the development of, of collaborative hubs between local authorities, schools, cultural organisations, the commercial sector, all delivering a music offer that's quite standardised for children and young people. So everyone knows what kind of music education children and young people should be getting. The plan that came out for cultural education last week is quite different from the National Plan of Music Education. Particularly, I think probably it's fair to say, and colleagues can argue with me whether I'm straying into opinion, is it doesn't really have a plan attached. What it is is a dossier of activity that's funded for children and young people across the country. So it explains initiatives that are already up and running, some fantastic practice, and it really has a call um, at the front of it from the Secretary of State um, for Education saying, this is some great practice, this is some great work, we urge you schools, we urge you cultural sector to read this, to be inspired and to go and make your own work happening. 
So there's great stuff in there, but what there isn't, which the music plan does provide, is a document that you can pick up whoever you are and think, ah, this is my job. This is the bit that I should, should be providing. Lizzie, thank you very much. Right. And Jane Bryant, the Executive Director of Artswork. Jane. Yes, hello everybody. I'm slightly different from David and Lizzie because I hadn't come prepared. My role is to, do, to pick up on some of the things that they said and, and put a reflection um, on it. The first thing to say about arts work is that arts work's been around for 25 years. It was uh, funded, uh, founded initially by Sir Ken Robinson. And those of you that know arts education may well know Sir Ken Robinson, who is a, a great leader um, and a dynamic inspiration to all of us who work in the arts and the education fields. If you don't know him, please Google him and do watch one of his TED lectures. We're, we're funded by the Arts Council to deliver a particular role in the Southeast, and that role is called the role of a bridge organisation. There are 10 bridge organisations in England, and we're funded between 2012 and 2015 to much better connect children and young people with great arts organisations, great cultural organisations. And that's children and young people both inside and out of school. And I think what I'd like to reflect on in all the, 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 the insight that both David and Lizzie have brought is that we are talking about children and young people. And I think it might be interesting to reflect momentarily on what sort of children and young people we would like to be nurturing, providing opportunities for, developing leadership skills uh, within. And while David and Lizzie have been talking, I've written down some words. Uh, creativity, self-esteem, an ability to express themselves, to develop that sense of wonder, imagination, curiosity, innovation, to be ready for the world of work and all that goes with that in terms of employability, social, team skills, communication skills. I think those are the sorts of young people that even our Secretary of State would be interested in schools nurturing. And actually schools do a fantastic job. Um, and it's, it's really the premise of the Arts Council that providing young people and children with the opportunity to participate enjoy, experience, and appreciate uh, the performing arts, because that's what we're here to talk about, will not only develop that love of the arts and develop their skills in the arts, but will also create those sorts of young people that I've just described uh, using those words. And in a very changing context for arts and cultural organizations, we really, working in the arts, have to hang on to the great added value that arts organisations and cultural organisations can bring to the educational experience that children and young people are having in schools. And there are some great teachers out there who are also ensuring that that happens. But our role as a bridge organisation is to connect those schools and to connect those children and young people with the great work that organisations like Chichester Festival Theatre are doing and providing children and young people with that enhancement to what schools can uh, provide, that real engagement with practice, with cultural and artistic practice that really complements the role of teachers. And that's what bridge organisations do. We work behind the scenes to help make those connections. And we've got some tools in our toolkit. Um, waiting for you as you go out is a couple of booklets wrapped up in an arts work leaflet, which talk about Arts Mark, which is an award scheme for schools. Any school can apply for Arts Mark. And at the heart of Arts Mark is uh, schools developing a policy for the arts and developing practice and real relationships with cultural and arts organizations. And then there's Arts Award, which is an individual award for children and young people. At the moment, children aged seven to, and young people aged seven to 25 can um, work towards an arts award. And it's on the qualifications and credit framework. And Gold Arts Award is also worth UCAS points. Um, and it's available on five levels, Discover, 
uh, explore, and then bronze, uh, silver, and gold. So those are two of the two uh, kit resources uh, that we have. And I think we should also remember that children and young people have a life outside school as well as inside school. And certainly Arts Award is... Uh, uh, available to uh, people who work with young people outside formal education settings as well as within schools. Well, I mean, that was a fascinating way to start. And I just want to pick up on a couple of things, and, and please all leap in. Um, you know, Michael Gove's stated aims were, you know, as far as I could understand, to drive up standards and control spending. In terms of the performing arts, um, you said a couple of things about there's less drama in the curriculum, that dance is slightly looser, but it's in PE, and you made the comment about uh, the coding, drama and dance being put together. It sounds, as a, to me as a layperson, that already the performing arts are going to be squeezed. Is that too simplistic, or do you both want to just answer that a little bit? Well, I think, I think they, in a sense, they have been squeezed in the current national curriculum, if I'm honest. They are, they are fairly hidden in, in the curriculum. I and mean, I think where you've got teachers who are enthusiastic about it and who draw it out, you can have a fantastic uh, experience in school. But where you don't have the expertise, it, it isn't necessarily emphasised to the extent that it should be. Um, and I think that this, the new national curriculum exacerbates that to an extent, because I think there's less of a framework to hang your, your arts education on. Busy. Absolutely agree. Um, it's interesting, the numbers of children and young people taking um, performing arts subjects at GCSE has been on the decline for about 10 years now. It, 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 when you look at the numbers, it, it's quite stark. Really interestingly, some of those trajectories are the same as history and geography, which was the Secretary of State's argument for why they have been included in the English Baccalaureate, because he wanted to create an incentive to drive up participation in those subjects. And in some ways, that has been successful. But as everybody will see, if you drive up participation in some subjects, those others will go steadily down. So unfortunately, last year, as a direct result of the English Baccalaureate being introduced as a performance measure, 15% of schools dropped an arts subject. We don't know yet until September what that will mean this year. We do know, again, which, which is a really alarming statistic, that it goes up to 23% in schools in areas of disadvantage with children and high proportions of free school meals. So it's those children that may not be getting other things that are also not getting those art subjects in their schools, which is something in the Cultural Learning Alliance we're very concerned about. And I think, um, again, echoing David, there isn't any incentive at the moment, either in terms of how schools are being measured or by the way that the curriculum is, is pushing schools to be structuring their learning for schools to be prioritising and nurturing the arts. So there are, there's nothing to say that you can't teach them, but there's nothing to push anybody that might not be personally enthusiastic to invest that time and investment into making them happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jane. And just to say, we've, we've got some evidence of, of what um, Lizzie is saying. We did a survey of schools' engagement with the arts and cultural sector, and we've just published the findings on our website. Um, and a number of uh, things here. The key drivers for schools' engagement with the arts and culture are demand from the senior leadership team, teachers, and students. Uh, where the senior leadership team sees its value, time and resources for arts and cultural education can be coordinated. Where schools report a decrease in arts and cultural engagement, changed government priorities are the main reason. So that backs up with recent evidence uh, what Lizzie and David have been saying. Thank you. And there, were, there was uh, something else that you said that uh, struck a chord and, and you picked up on, Lizzie. Um, you made the point very early on that free schools and paid-for education and academies are not part of this. You also made the point about the context within which these are happening, savage cuts to the arts funding providers, all of the cultural organisations, which sounds like a rather painful double whammy for children who are from environments with possibly less provision anyway. Would you like to comment on both of those points, all of you, please? Yes, I think um, in terms of the, uh, the, you know, the, the national curriculum not being compulsory in academies and, and in free schools, you need to set that against the fact that they will nevertheless be assessed against the national curriculum. So when Ofsted inspectors come into an academy, 
uh, or a free school, they will assess it against the standards in the national curriculum. So um, it's, it's not as if they can ignore it completely. Um, but I think, you know, in a sense, that is also going to drive even those schools to, to be wary about taking on some subjects or prioritising some of the arts subjects as well. Lizzie. I think it's very interesting, the place of the national curriculum in, in policy at the moment, because as we know, one of the stated aims of this government is for all schools to become academies and for more free schools to open. So it seems as if the, the sort of direction of travel is for the national curriculum to be a sort of nice background guide, but not to be the sort of important document that it's been thus far. And particularly interesting, I, I don't know if colleagues saw um, Stephen Twigg made his first major speech about education from Labour a couple of weeks ago. And in that, they pledged to um, open up all academy freedoms to any school that wanted them. So again, that's the freedom not to follow the national curriculum. So it looks a little bit like whatever government um, is in power next five years or so, the national curriculum is going to lose the position that it's had in, in, in being mandatory for all schools. Now, for us, in terms of, of every child and young person getting access to an arts and cultural offer, that's a real issue because schools are one of the only places where we can talk about every child. You know, when, when we talk about the sorts of offers that happen around it, when we talk about youth services, when we talk about cultural organisations, those are much more patchy. And some young people get access to fantastic things like Chichester. Others live in areas or, or, or live in, in, in particular circumstances where that's not a reality. So even though school is only part of that picture, it's, it's a really critical one in terms of that entitlement. One of the roles um, that the Arts Council has set for the bridge organisations, and I said I, I explained that arts work is a bridge organisation, is that we should work to better connect children and young people that are not accessing uh, the arts and culture with uh, the offer in their localities. And we are therefore bringing people together. Part of our role is to bring people together. Lizzie spoke about those arts organizations that are in straightened circumstances. Every arts organization has had a budget cut. How can we therefore better connect people to bring better uh, value to what they are doing? And we are doing that through local networks, through bringing arts organisations round the table together with schools and other children and young people organisations to do more informed planning, to look at the identified needs of children and young people that aren't being met and to look collaboratively how together, uh, uh, through a little bit of encouragement and investment, there can be much better strategic planning, to, particularly to reach those that are not being touched uh, by the arts and culture. So that's part of our role. And indeed, we see some of the outcomes of that work already happening across the southeast region. Thank you. I mean, j just to pursue this, this point a little bit further, uh, do you think some of the reports that we've all read in the newspapers are justified? The worry that there is going to be an elite of children in paid for education in particular, who, whose parents are paying for these services and they will be stripped out of any sort of basic education provision from anyone else. This has been quite a lot, certainly of The Guardian's headlines, yes, obviously, yes. needless to say, but I don't know what The Telegraph's saying, forgive me. Um, but I mean, that, that seems to be quite specific and there've been a lot of examples of musicians, actors, all of these people who have ha come from that route and the suggestion that that will be harder for anybody outside of that environment to break into you. Do you think that's a legitimate concern or is that slightly just playing politics in the way that often happens? I, I mean, I think there is a concern. I come from a modern languages teaching background and I saw what happened to modern languages when it was actually taken out as a compulsory subject and, and before it was put into the, the English baccalaureate and it, and it virtually disappeared uh, at the end of the um, curriculum, the key stage four curriculum. So I think you know, we shouldn't underestimate the risks of subjects that are not in this. And, and of course, in, in many other countries, the baccalaureate is, is a much broader arrangement than what we have here. I mean, if you go to France, there are different sorts of baccalaureate. So you can, you know, you can study a technical one, you can study an arts-based one. So it actually allows uh, youngsters to study a basket of subjects. Uh, it enables them to carry on with the maths and science, but also but to major in some other areas of the curriculum. And I think it's a big missed opportunity that, for that here. Uh, and I think it, it is this sort of placing a, a, a greater value on some subjects as against others, um, which you know, really does risk 
those subjects um, having a much less prominent place. And I think the, and the risk was, as we saw in modern languages, the area where languages disappeared off the curriculum were in the most deprived areas. And that was consistent throughout the country. Lizzie, do you have anything to add to that? Um, we did a bit of work, actually, recently in the Cultural Learning Alliance, um, doing a survey of head teachers of major independent schools, asking them um, how they felt about arts and culture and why they would prioritise it within their curricula. It was really interesting findings. Um, <clears throat> quite a lot of people said, actually, parents absolutely expect us to have an exemplary cultural offer as part of our, our learning. You know, th they're paying for young people to have this experience, and what they want is for them to come out to be culturally lit literate, culturally understanding, um, and have that, that broad range. Which is quite an interesting um, insight that actually what we, we probably need to be focusing on in, in the face of disincentives coming from national policy is growing that demand. If we're looking at growing choice, if we're looking at taking the Secretary of State at his word, that actually what parents should do is demand from their schools the kind of learning that they want to have, it's about how we talk to parents and we talk to young people about the arts and culture and why that might be something that they would want to choose. So... I think, I think there is a place here for the cultural sector and the learning sector to be working to have that kind of dialogue and that, that kind of conversation with parents and, and young people so that we start talking about our sector and the, the work that we're passionate about in, in ways that are really clear. And I think that's got to be about saying, you know, actually, we've got the evidence to prove that if you do arts and culture in schools, you do better in English, you do better in maths, you're more likely to get a job, you're more likely to get a degree, you're more likely to stay in employment um, five or six years after you've finished learning, you're more likely to vote, and you're more likely to volunteer. And if you want to know any of the details behind any of that, you can look on our Cultural Learning Alliance website and we can find you all the uh -huh. stats, or I can wave them at you afterwards. But all of those things are true, and I think quite often we, we're not able to make that place clearly enough that, yes, there are wonderful intrinsic value around culture, but it also has a real worth that parents and young people can see from, from, from having those experiences. So advocacy as it being essential absolutely. rather than peripheral, absolutely. absolutely. Jane, do you want to contribute uh, to that? Just, just a couple of things, really. Um, again, our survey that we did uh, quite recently says that independent schools are more likely than state schools to report having an arts and cultural offer. Um, and just one thing I wrote down uh, while David was speaking some time ago, uh, earlier today, um, performance measurement could devalue that which is not being measured. And I think um, we have to work uh, with Ofsted at how they measure performance in schools. At the moment, they don't really look at uh, how they measure the quality of arts and culture. And I think it would be very helpful if in order to be an outstanding school, that the quality of arts and cultural education was taken into account uh, by Ofsted. But I just wanted to pick up on something that uh, Lizzie said around children and young people's voice. You didn't, you didn't put it quite like that. But um, uh, without the voice of children and young people, we are missing a major stakeholder in, in these debates. And I think that I mentioned Arts Award uh, earlier. What Arts Award does is develop young people's leadership. It enables them to take, play a leadership role in art skills, but also to develop their advocacy, their sense of why they do what they want to do and what's important to them. And I think if we can work to develop young people's voice, there is nothing more powerful for any kind of politician, whether it's local or national, to hear young people talk directly to them about what matters to individual young people. And if we can somehow work together to harness the voice and experience of children and young people, that would help us all advocate more powerfully uh, locally and nationally and underline what is important to children and young people in this debate. Thank you, Jane, very much. Is Michael Gove right to be trying to change things? I know that's how long is a piece of string, but in a way that, you know, is he right to be trying to make changes, regardless of whether we think they're good or bad? I, I think the time has come now where we, we needed to up the ante in terms of what was being taught in schools 
Uh, I think, in a sense, it's a measure of the success of what's been achieved so far, is it now needs to be taken on to a different level. So it isn't all misguided. It's, there no, are some I, sensible I, things. I think like most good. of the things with this government, there's a hodgepodge of some really good stuff mixed in with things which are a little bit more dubious. Lizzie, would you agree with that, that it's right to be trying to Absolutely. change things? I think you've always no. got to be forward-looking and you've always got to be thinking, how can we do this better? Particularly when young people are going into a world and an economy and a workplace and actually a society with a whole different set of moral, emotional, intellectual dilemmas that they're, they're going to have to face over the next 20, 50 years. We need to be thinking about the kinds of education that they might need and that they might want to have. And it's always a great opportunity to to think about what that is. I think what I take issue with it sometimes is the narrow definition of some of the words that are used around that change. So I believe in rigour. I really believe in stretching young people. I believe in, in giving them the most sort of fabulous, high-quality, excellent opportunities that they can possibly have. But I think sometimes the word rigour is used to mean academic in its very strictest sense by this government. It's, it's, it's meant to mean writing essays. It's meant to mean remembering dates. It's meant to mean things that are very knowledge-based. And like I said, I don't have a problem with knowledge. I think it's very important. But I want to see it alongside skills, competency, understanding. I want young people to get that rounded kind of education. So I am absolutely pro-change. I think we can always be doing things in a better way. But, but I think we're being driven down a model of change that isn't broad enough. Lovely. Thank you. Jane? Uh, yes, it's, it's lovely being third, actually, because everybody, everybody <laughs> said it all. I'm going to mix it up in a moment. <laughs> Just wait. Um, yes, yes, he is right to be, change, to make, to be making changes. Uh, and I would say this, I'm afraid. I don't think they're necessarily the right changes. Um, and uh, I think you'll have heard from what I've been saying today that I would have preferred more emphasis on practical skills, the need for us to be developing designers and innovators and engineers who are creative, forward-looking, the need to have IT and, and digital work at the heart of that. Um, so, yes, change is, is, is refreshing. I would have liked Michael Gove to have listened a little bit more to the professionals who are working in education and, of course, to the arts and cultural sector. Why not? Um, but um, I admire his determination to strive for improvement and raising of standards. I may not always agree with uh, the detail of what he's produced. Lovely. Well, thank you. Um, so please feel free um, to ask a question of anybody on the panel, but equally, if you have something that you'd like to say as either a professional or as a parent, uh, whatever your context is, please just feel free to contribute however you want. Does anybody want to join in? Uh, Greg Slay. I work for West Sussex County Council, and uh, I'm fellow of the RSA, and I'm interested in the question, uh, to ask, pose a question about vision for education. Uh, these are changes to the national curriculum that are being proposed here, which clearly will, as David has said, will, will affect all schools, but will particularly affect those schools that local education authorities have a particular interest in. Um, and I wondered what the vision was longer term for the next 10 to 15 years in terms of what the role local authorities might play as strategic leaders in supporting education for children and young people, particularly in relation to um, arts development and involvement in arts programs. And is that very much going to be down to individual local authorities to take a strategic leadership on from an elected member perspective? Or is it going to, is it going to be a kind of postcode lottery about what local authorities do in terms of showing leadership? Or is, or is the focus on local authorities really going to be on delivering this national curriculum based focus, narrow type focus, um, bearing in mind local authorities also have particular responsibilities to children in the care, children in care system. Great. Thank you very much, Greg. Well, I mean, you'll, as, as has already been stated, there are you know, dramatic cuts being made in the education budget at the moment. And so things that we used to be able to do as a local authority, like we ran a very successful youth theatre, um, we, we have a wonderful dance programme, and there were a number of arts programmes which, in a sense, were doing what uh, James was talking about, was en enabling s children to take on their, their, their arts work their, um, beyond what was in the school and, and, and excel at a higher level. Now, we're not able to do that in that way anymore, um, but I think what we're trying to do is explore new ways of achieving the same objectives and actually probably finding better ways of doing that. 
um, and will engage the local community more in, in, in delivering those sorts of programs. So I think um, we won't do it in the way that we've done it in the past. Um, we'll have to look at more cost-effective ways and we'll have to engage the community more in delivering those sorts of programs. But I think that can be to the benefit of the whole community if, if we can get that right. Um, so I think it's, uh, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a real challenge. Um, but I think, um, and I would hope that this authority is one that will stick to its guns and see the value of it, because as everybody has said, it's not whether you do an art subject or a science subject or another subject. They all contribute to create the whole person. And if you're talking about a vision for the future, that that child, that person, if again, their life chances are going to be the best they can possibly have. They need to have that subtle combination of all of that, those elements of the curriculum. Thank you very much. Lizzie, do you have anything to contribute on this? I do. I mean, unfortunately, in terms of local authority place and delivery of national curriculum and education, I think over the next 10 years, the general thinking is that schools will be charged with doing much more of them that themselves. And, and it seems very much that that vision of a decentralised sort of power model where schools get funded directly from, from, from central government, um, where they make decisions about how they use their budgets, about how they deliver their, their, their education, appears to be the vision that, that we're going down. And I think what we lose from that is that incredible expertise and thought leadership that resides within local authorities. And I kind of want to echo David that in a time when local authorities are really experiencing absolutely shrinking resource, those local authorities that can be beacons for protecting their investment into culture and children and young people and can share that learning and that understanding of new ways of doing things are going to be invaluable in in, in being really the creators of that vision. I mean, there was some, some research that was done a couple of years ago now, um, when just when the first cuts to local authorities came in, saying that actually culture and youth services were the two services that are first cut most often by local authorities because they're not statutory. Uh, they're not ring-fenced. And as we can see, the incentives are not there um, for local authorities to be continuing to fund them unless they stand by their belief that they're important and make that provision. Um, so, yes, I, I think local authority leaders have a real role to play in shouting loudly about why these things need to be prioritised and about the innovations that they come across to make them work. I think everybody is hungry to find out new ways of doing things. We aren't going to be able to save models as they are now. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to move forward and find a new kind of landscape to work within. Thank you. Jane. Um, part of our uh, role as a bridge organisation is indeed to work with local authorities, to make relationships with local authorities and find new ways of working. Um, and uh, all local authorities have corporate objectives and part of our role is to uh, have that conversation with a local authority, find out what the corporate objectives are around perhaps uh, antisocial behaviour, youth offending, rural isolation, young people in care, to look at their uh, policies around troubled families, to look at what they're doing around early intervention, and to work with the local authority to say, how might the arts and cultural sector help you meet some of your objectives. And as a bridge organisation, we can act as a broker with nothing to gain from that ourselves, but to better connect cultural organisations with the objectives of different local authority service departments and where it's appropriate to invest a little bit in that relationship as well. So um, we very much see local authorities, albeit in a changing, reducing context, as part of the partnership framework for the region that we will want uh, to work with. I'm Sean and I'm a health visitor and I've worked both in Chichester and in areas where there are many children who go to school and need free meals. And what I've noticed and what worries me is if those are the schools that are going to cut back on their arts most dramatically, um, those children are going to be doubly disadvantaged yet again because they already start school with problems with playing imaginatively, having access to play, and these sorts of issues. Um, and I just think they'll be penalised further. 
So I think it's very short-sighted to the government because in acting and in you know, doing art, you can be somebody else, you can learn those skills. And if those are cut, then once again, when you're going for jobs, you won't have those opportunities. So for me, I think it's a great shame, really. Thank you, Sean. Would anybody like to respond? Or We will agree, I hope. <laughs> yes. I would agree. Thank you. Lady next door. I'm Charlotte McGinney, I'm a parent. I just want to add to what Sean said. It goes back to Ken Robinson, in fact. And I remember so clearly listening to one of his talks. And he said, children arrive at school age five, singing, dancing, they want to be doing things. By the time you leave school, that's all been knocked out of you. And partly because you're sitting down, being quiet, and children are not supposed to be sitting down and being quiet all the time. You can learn so much through creative play, and that's got to be kept. It really has. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Jill Street. I'm Head of Performing Arts at Bourne Community College. Um, just a sort of point, as far as I know, we're not cutting any of our um, opportunities for students at, at the, where I teach. Um, otherwise, my job will be on the line, I presume. Um, and in fact, I think actually what we're trying to do is actually inc in increase it so that I know that the plan sort of for the following year is to give students more options and allow them to have more choice. And, and that is the plan. Um, is, do you think there's any way that we could put any pressure on the government to add the creative arts to the baccalaureate? David. Well, I, all I would say is that schools like the Bourne, which um, you know, have a really good track record, value the arts. And, and it goes back to what we've been saying there. Actually, your children will do better if they have a good arts programme running alongside the rest of the curriculum. And most schools that achieve an outstanding status have a, a, a rich arts curriculum. So, you know, it, it's, it's clear that it contributes to, to that. So it's actually quite short-sighted to, to, to draw back on it, but I can understand why some schools feel under huge pressure to do that. I think, I think this will evolve. Uh, I think there is a chance that as, you know, some of the deficiencies in having a sort of a single back model emerge, that there will be pressure. And I think we're already seeing that, of having a, a wider range of those models available. Do you, just, just to pick up on what Jill's saying, though, about specific, you know, is there anything that can be done? You know, are there specific steps that people can take? But, I mean, specific yeah. things that any of us can do as individuals as well as uh, education providers. Yes. I mean, I think, you know, that, that this government will respond particularly to schools and to teachers uh, and also to parents. So I think, you know, if, if um, through, through the sort of networks that schools have, they can feed that up to the Secretary of State, that is a powerful way of doing it. I think as a local authority, as I say, I think what we can be doing is, is looking at new ways in which we can continue to offer arts programmes which extend children beyond what they do at school. And I think it goes back to the point that was made earlier on about building the demand. What we want is for parents to come to schools and say, we've heard there are really good arts things that are available out there, and you as a school can subscribe to that. Are you doing that? And getting the pressure from the parents, if you like, to say, we know it's a good thing. If you're not doing it, why aren't you doing it? And if you don't do that, we might take our child to another school where they do do that. And I think that we've got to engage that level of pressure on it as well. Thank you. And Lizzie, I mean, the CLA has had some success, actually, talking directly to government and trying to change things. So we have do. you got some tips? Oh, yes, we do. I mean, we, we, we try and keep our all, all channels of dialogue with anybody that wants to talk to us open. So we talk to the government quite a lot. Um, and we've talked a lot about EBAC, as you can imagine, over the last year um, with the Secretary of State and with the civil servants. Um, there was a consultation, and it all starts to get into the murky technical land of, of government policy development. But there was a consultation a couple of months ago on school accountability frameworks, which is really consultation on what do we do about EBAC and other performance measures. That hasn't been reported on yet. So in the next couple of weeks... Um, well, no, actually, because we've, we've just broken up for recess, so probably in, in September, we will start to see the government's official response to that consultation and what their particular stance on EBAC and performance measures will be. It's always wi worth writing to your MP. It's always worth doing it. The really good trick is to ask them to write to the Secretary of State on your behalf because the Secretary of State has to respond to your MP. It's, it, it's in the system. So if you want to ask Michael Gove something personally, 
get your get your MP to write that on your behalf and do it. And I, I think it absolutely is worth um, looking at that. We've published on the Cultural Learning Alliance website a sort of toolkit of information. So all that evidence stuff, um, all the stuff about that consultation, all the stuff about some of the arguments that you might want to make and how you might want to make them. And um, if you can't find it, just email me and I'll send you a little crib sheet of various bits and pieces. I think it absolutely is worth keeping on the agenda, particularly because in February there was a sort of widespread erroneous belief that the EBAC had been U-turned. I must say, I, I was, it was only getting this briefing document. I thought, oh, I thought it had gone. <laughs> yes, actually. And, yeah. and what actually went was they were going to rename GCSEs English Baccalaureate Certificates, and they haven't done that. So they haven't changed the name of GCSEs, but the EBAC as a performance measure, this, as it's always stood, is absolutely up there. It hasn't changed at all, and it's still doing all the same things that it has done. And that is news to most people. So I think be vocal <laughs> and, and, and make sure you're keeping it on the agenda because when we get the next lot of data in September and we're able to see what, 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 what's happened to the arts as a, a result of it, my gut feeling is we're going to see more of a reduction. And I think that because the Secretary of State stood up a couple of weeks ago and um, said to the RE lobby, to the Church of England, I know that leaving RE out of, of, of the EBAC has been a real problem and actually RE has declined and I can see that that's the case. Now the art subjects are exactly the same as RE in, in, in that they're not in, in the EBAC. And so if they're already admitting that it's happening for RE, I think we'll, we'll see that it's, it's happening for the arts as well. Is it, I mean, I don't know if anybody either in the audience or on the panel knows this, I, um, is it a difficult thing? So for head of performing arts like Jill, and we've got a great deal of experience and the girls high before born and all of these things, is it a difficult thing for an individual teacher in a school to make that point? Because it seems to me that in a funny sort of way, yet again, we're asking teachers to sort out the government policy. And uh, does that not make individuals rather... Vulnerable. I mean, what if the head teacher doesn't agree? Or, I mean, I, I would say that uh, head teachers need to be on side, um, and there are head teachers up and down the country who absolutely feel passionately about uh, the importance of arts and culture. And I heard one the other day who uh, was talking at a conference that we were involved with, and he said, uh, "We are one of the best schools in our county. We have the best." Uh, GCSE um, outcomes in the uh, county, we value the arts and culture. We have absolutely no intention of cutting our arts and cultural provision. We value our partnerships with the arts and cultural sector, and I'm prepared to say that publicly. And I think if we can get more and more head teachers talking about the importance of arts and culture. I was really buoyed up by the National Union of Teachers, the, the National Conference, where um, it came from one of the speakers there, the importance of arts and culture, the threat that they are under at the moment because of current policy. But I think the arts and cultural sector can get a bit smarter about the sorts of conversations that they have with schools. They can, we, 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 the curriculum is as it is, and I know there's a little bit of shaping to do, but we may need to work with that for the next three to five years. If that's as it is, there's no point hiding our head under the sand and thinking this is terrible. Actually, arts and cultural organizations like education organizations, we're resilient, we can find new ways of working, new ways of developing partnerships, and new language to work together. And I think the arts and cultural sector need to develop that new sense of language. They need to make their offer really relevant to schools, speaking in schools' language. And I think bridge organizations across the country can help uh, make that language and, and make the cultural sector understand the changing landscape so that we can be developing new partnerships. Uh, my name's Roy Ward. Uh, in the limited distant past when I was being educated, we had extracurricular activity as well as curricular activity. And I just wonder, listening to this debate, whether we're not expecting too much to be in the curriculum and not enough emphasis being placed in the wider education aspects of extracurricular activity and whether in fact that can ever become a, like it was as I in say, the old in days. The past. <laughs> yes. Thank Lovely. Thank you. I mean, I think that is a really good point. You can't deliver the whole, uh, you know, all, all of the potential, if you like, within uh, the, the sort of regular teaching part of the day. 
And I think that's where it is incumbent on us, people like us and other organizations, to work together to surround schools with those broader opportunities. You tend to get that well in the, in the sports area, where children can go off and play sports in clubs and excel in that way. We need to develop that sort of infrastructure, I think, for the arts as well. I think there's also considerable potential for the independent sector to work more closely with state schools and share some of the resources and expertise that they have around this, because you know, they, they, they have the children there all day, um, and they can, they can extend that curriculum into a whole lot of areas. And so now I think many of them are cheek by jowl with, with, with other state schools close by, and I think there's real potential for sharing resource and expertise uh, across the system in that way. Thank you. I've got two points I want to make on that. Um, one is, really interestingly, the relationship between ex extracurricular and curricular is quite a close one, because the person who generally or you know, organises the school orchestra to play after school is the music teacher, and the music teacher is only hired if music is on the curriculum. And similarly, if you are doing after-school activities in drama, then it's an English teacher or a drama teacher specialist who is the person that drives that. What you also often find is that delicate balance of somebody who's got time and got energy within their job to phone up the likes of Jane and say, hello, the Bridge Organisation, we'd love to work with some cultural organisations in our local vicinity. What's out there? How do we work with it? How do we work with ArtSmart? What is it? are those specialist teachers. So what we're starting to see is fewer of those teachers being employed in schools, which then leads to a drop-off in terms of extracurricular activity and that wider development with the community. The second thing I want to say about sport is brilliant stuff happens in sport. It's funded in a completely different way. If you look just last year, um, 300 million over two years was put into just primary school sport as an extra on top of what's already there in, in terms of sport and, and funding for sport. There's an infrastructure that, that works, and it's sort of a historic in infrastructure from local coaches that understand that it's their responsibility to work with schools. They, they, there's specific people that have been in post to sort of do inter-school championships, and it's a link that sort of works all the way up to professional sport. It's, it's great, but it has... It has developed over 20 years and has had quite a lot of investment in, into making that work. If we could have the same for culture, we'd be in a fantastic position, I think. Thank you. Jane? The, the, the po I think you make a very good point. I think my concern around it is that for many young people who are not really engaging terribly well in school, they're unlikely to have the opportunity or the parental support to continue to do out-of-school activities. Many are reliant on bus transport and have to leave the school because they're in rural areas to take the bus home. And I think it's a bit more hit and miss. And I, 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 I'm very much in favour of, of a core entitlement for young people um, to have access to a range of good quality arts within the school day. Um, and those that have the opportunity to develop those skills um, to do so then in an extracurricular way. But if you don't provide that basic entitlement, you then don't have the material to, for young people to progress from. Um, and I think the other thing uh, I would say is that um, there, there's been some research uh, done by the, some of the academies and the academy trusts where they've looked at youth service provision that happens on the same site um, as a school. And what they've identified um, is really encouraging that where youth service and school work collaboratively around young people's engagement in and out of school, that has really good outcomes, long-term outcomes for the young person. But that takes that infrastructural cooperation uh, to make that work really well. Thank you. Lady next door in pink. Margaret Ward. Um, my experience is so far back, it's out of sight. But it was with uh, business studies, but also with dance. Um, I've got a very short question. You've talked about the uh, largely where it really works, cooperation and where. But you did allude to places perhaps schools or even more areas where there wasn't much provision. And I just would like to know whether you think 
the biggest sufferers in these areas? Are they boys or girls? Oh, that's a big question when we've only got 25 minutes left. Does anybody want to wrestle with that one? I, I'm afraid or I don't even think have I've got, an opinion. I, I, haven't, I don't have the evidence to say whether it affects boys more than girls. Um, I was in a, an all-girls school uh, last week, actually, looking a week before, looking at their art, their GCSE art exhibition, and it was just staggeringly good, and the dance provision there. And certainly, the head teacher's view was that in that in, in, that, in an all-girls school, the arts provision is, is very secure, and there's tremendous enthusiasm from the pupils for, for the art subjects. Um, but whether in, in the mixed school there are more girls and boys that, that participate, maybe my colleagues over here would have a, a better handle on that than I do. Thank you. I think where dance really comes into its own um, in terms of, of girls is that often girls at GCSE level sort of choose not to progress in their physical education and dance is one of the things that, that enables them to keep that progression going and, and, and in, just inspires them. Um, whereas the evidence that I've seen around boys that's particularly interesting is that dance gives um, a completely new dimension to physical education and their physical learning. So it's not just about a competitive skill or, or, or one of those things. It's something where there's an emotional dimension, where we're thinking about what we're trying to convey, where we're thinking about the story behind dance, where we're thinking about how, how, how your body works in a team with other people to convey those kind of things. Um, so it, it has so many differing benefits to, to different um, children and young people. So the lack of dance in the curriculum um, is something that I think is one of the major problems. There's sort of three. Uh, film is completely absent and digital media almost non-existent. Um, so particularly in, in it, the English GCSE, it looks at um, uh, it, it says digital text shouldn't be used. <laughs> which to me is, is nonsensical. But dance is, is only described in the national curriculum in terms of movement and physical activity. It's not talked about in terms of performance or creation. And so the, the whole of those other dimensions aren't included in it, which I think is a, a huge loss. And if we sort of take that, you know, lots of the evidence is that boys need that as part of their physical education, I, I think that's going to be a problem. I actually slightly disagree with David about drama in that that sentence that David put up on his slide, I don't know if we can have it back. We actually drafted that in a Cultural Learning Alliance workshop with the DfE. Which sentence? The sentence it? about drama. Right. It, I don't know if you can find it. it really interestingly, it's been changed. So it says, in order to develop creative writing at the beginning. So our suggestion for that sentence was, all children should have access to drama. Learners should be enabled to. And as you can see from the, from the sentence, it describes drama but it's written in terms of creative writing. So that's the only real mention of drama, I think, in the curriculum. That, and it's in guidance. It's not in the statutory bit. It's in the guidance. Um, so drama in terms of a discipline with canon and rigor and, and, and a real set of knowledge, skills, and understanding is, is not in there. So for me, those three things are, are a huge issue and will have implications for the development of both girls and boys as they progress through that. Thank you. Jane? I've just got one thing to add to that. Uh, I think it's a very interesting question that you ask there, and possibly one we ought to do some research around. Um, two examples to draw uh, from. One, a mixed comprehensive, and the other, a boys-only comprehensive. Uh, the mixed comprehensive recognised that boys were not achieving to the same level and standards as girls in uh, GCSE and at Key Stage 3, and they put a major focus on boys' dance. And they were able to follow that through over a four-year period. Uh, it's a difficult thing because it wasn't a scientific research study. But over that four-year period where boys were participating in dance, they were able to uh, correlate the outcomes at GCSE with those that were participating in dance, which I thought was quite uh, interesting. The other one, a boys' comprehensive um, in Windsor and Maidenhead, again, recognising that boys' performance wasn't great, they developed a junk percussion band. Now, if you know anything about junk percussion, you know it's physical and it's loud. Um, uh, and the boys participated in that. They got invited to perform here, there, and everywhere. Self-esteem rose. That had uh, benefits right across uh, the curriculum, which resulted in higher outcomes for them again at GCSE. So that shows the power, if you like, of, of, of performing arts, particularly 
Um, and, and it would apply as much to girls as boys, but these are two boys-only examples. And I'm so, sure uh, you at Bourne Community School will have uh, interesting examples of focusing on boys particularly, but as well as girls. It has benefits across the curriculum, but I think that question that you ask is particularly interesting. Thank you very much. Quick question from that gentleman. Uh, Alf Park, and my background is mainly primary education. Uh, it seems to me that what we're talking about is, is the lack of status that's been given to performing arts. And I think you have to be realistic in, in realising, perhaps, that you're not going to get it in the EBAC. So the answer seems to me to have a range of EBACs, because technical education, Germany has a, a BAC that, that, that gives equal status to the technical side as to the core subjects in, in, in the academic subjects. So I think if you had a, a menu of EBACs with the performing arts element, with the technical element and so on, rather than just a single EBAC, and I think maybe you would make more progress going down that road, trying to get it included in this single one. Thank you. Thank you very much.